Amanda. Here we are. Hi. What's happening? What's happening? Mm. Mm. Right well, now. Um, right now. I'm actually, I'm getting ready to um, go to San Francisco tomorrow. Mm. And I'm enjoying, I'm actually, I was harvesting some seeds from the garden today. Um, I'm in Colorado, Southwest Colorado, and um, planted a beautiful garden this year. And it's going to freeze while I'm gone. So making some of those preparations, you know, mentally too, I've been just thinking about the shift of seasons. It's kind of like a new year this time, this time of year for me. Mm -hmm. um, just came back from Burning Man. How was that? And it was a really, really, really special year and mm -hmm. experience. This is my 11th year out there, which is hard to believe. <laughs> wow. And I, I had a lot of really fantastic um, realizations, revelations. And, um, you know, the theme this year was metamorphosis. And it couldn't have been more appropriate, I think. I feel so, somewhat surprisingly, I feel more in a cocoon kind of like afterwards mm. um, than I had, um, ex, you know, thought I would. I, I think like this coming year in 2020 coming has become more of, um, you know, is becoming more apparent and mm. more like powerful and interesting than some of the years past. Like yeah, what are, your, what are your observations? Anything specific or just a feeling? Well, one thing that I am pretty keyed into right now because of a painting that I just started um, is it has to do with the, the presidential elections in the U.S. <laughs> Which, you know, it... it oh gosh, such a big deal is made out Oof. of it. And it is a big deal. Yes. You know, and I think in, in years past, I've, I've chosen to not, I've somehow told myself it was okay to not be that involved. Um, and was very disillusioned, I think, by the mm. whole system, you know? Mm, so it was yeah. like, it just, it just, it was more frustrating, I think. Um, and I, I felt that doing things locally and doing what I was doing was supporting, you know, humanity and the grander scale of, of social and political kind of um, mm -hmm. context. And I think, and I do believe that still, but I think there is something to being involved actually politically um, mm -hmm. Because it's not to, to just invent a new system or to think that that's possible that would completely, um, you know, make the old system void or something. I think that's, I've realized that that's quite um, utopic. I was about <laughs> to say that. that, yeah. It's not very realistic. And, it, and to, to be, to go into and to consider the current system and how we can from within heal. Um, mm -hmm. I find that very interesting. And there's one candidate who is um, someone I've, I've been aware of and I've, I have really enjoyed for many years. Her name is Marianne Williamson. Mm -hmm. And she wrote A Return to Love. I think that was one of the first books that I, yeah. I learned about. And she's just always rung a strong bell of resonance in me, you know, and... I've started paying more attention to her stepping up as uh, a presidential candidate being kind of like, Oh, really? <laughs> That's interesting. And the more I've listened to her, the more I've become kind of inspired, um, turned on in a way that I haven't been before. Mm -hmm. uh, she just makes a lot more sense because she's approaching it from a different angle. Yeah, it does seem very balanced, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and so I, a, f a friend of mine, and then choosing to remain anonymous, has um, commissioned me to do a portrait of her. Beautiful. Have you and started so, it yet? Yes, I have. Cool. <laughs> in the last couple of days, actually, I started to really dive in to the actual drawing and canvas, and I've been thinking about it for a bit, for sure, and... Um, but now 
during painting, I have a wonderful opportunity where I can listen to things. And so I've been listening to a bunch of her talks and just allowing it to really deepen, uh, like her message, allow that to deepen within me. And um, I, I'm pretty excited about it. Mm. And I, you know, and also looking forward to um, Burning Man 2020. That's like a year from now. I, I've, I found a lot of um, resonance with people out there around that being a really powerful moment of, of, of reference, of looking at where we are. Um, and I have some projects, this project called The Vision Train, which is um, something I've been working on for a couple of years, though it's still been, I call it in beta version. <laughs> and, and describe um, that, what's that? So it's, um, it's, a, it's a collaborative, it's an it's a interactive, participatory um, art project mm. where um, everyone is invited. And I say every, everyone that I come across is invited to share their vision in a train car. So they, I have this little um, template of a train car that I drew for my friend's fourth grade class a couple of years ago. And um, inside that is, it's a box. It's a white box. What are you going to put in that box? It's a container. And that container is your container. And the invitation is to share your dreams, solutions, and prayers. Mm. Um, and it's a, it's a space to also explore that concept, what, it, what that is for you. Um, because a lot of people I've, I've noticed with this um, beta version that we've been running in various workshops and schools and um, festivals, uh, people are sometimes like, wow, that's a big thing. I don't know. Um, you have to think about this. And I'm like, well, that's good. Think about it. You know, mm -hmm. one of the ways that you can think about it is by sitting down and grabbing one of these colored pencils that's here, whichever one speaks to you because all of them are good. <laughs> so you just have to, one of them is, one of them is going to jump up and say me first. And then you pick that. You don't think too much. And then you start making marks and, and, and consider this, these questions. You know, consider this, get into that feeling of wanting to know, being curious, reveal, you know, yeah. and, and, and so that leads people then into an interesting space, you know, of, of potential and opportunity. They become open. You That's know? so beautiful. That gives me shivers down my spine mm -hmm. just hearing you talk about that because mm. we, we see so much of that creativity just getting slammed down in the in the distractedness of life and the busyness of life and the quote-unquote seriousness of life and to get back in touch with that creative flow just lights people up and even it feels even potentially crucial in bridging that gap between like having utopian hope of like using our imagination in beautiful ways and getting creative and playful and light at the same time discerning and getting uh, grounded and real. It, it seems potentially very balancing and bring, bringing people together, getting creative, collaborating, getting playful, letting that utopian hope flow at the same time. Mm. And so, so, so the ultimate vision for this is the peace train, okay. is to build a peace train. Cool. And I, I saw this, uh, the peace train came to me um, about seven years ago, seven, eight years ago. It kind of downloaded as a result of a variety of experiences and, that I was having where I saw this as a very real thing. That was, I mean, I grew up with Cat Stevens' song, The Peace Train, you know, and Bob Marley. And there's a bunch of great train songs out there, you know, and train's language is very much embedded in like the English language. You know, it comes from the Industrial Revolution. And this whole thing, the, the train came as this um, vessel that could take us on this journey into yeah. the future 
you know, and carrying all the good, something like a, like a new world's fair of the genius of humanity, you know, celebrating the diversity on this planet of animals and plants and hum- and humans and culture, music, art, food, uh, all the things, you know, and then also honor the sciences and honor um, the traditions of the indigenous, of all our indigenous heritage. You know, so this kind of ancient future theme of honoring our past to be able to step into um, a world that we are proud to leave behind. Mm. You know, what kind of legacy do you want to live? And I think we're at this point where, you know, with the environment and with um, the international uh, scene, you know, that has become so globalized through the internet, right? And we're, we're mm. looking at our, you know, our differences and the stance on war that, you know, these nations have. And, you know, it's like, what do the people have to say about this? And what are actually our values? And how does, how does the kind of system that is running um, the world so much of like how, how finances and, you know, mm. it's just, it's it, it, the marketing system, how, um, you know, there's so much um, that is so much propaganda that is used actually against us. Um, and it's like a lot of people know this and they're like, mm, I don't know, what can I yeah, do about it? True. You know, and, and it's, it's just silly. I think a lot of people are realizing more and more that it's silly. And I feel like that there's, I feel like the majority, and this is just my random sense, but I feel like the majority is ready for something to, 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 to graduate in many ways, even mm-hmm. if they don't know it for sure, yeah. you know, like it, because I think a lot of people are exploring and opening their minds. And um, even if they're not going to a yoga class, mm-hmm. even if they're not, but they may be watching them and doing them at home. You know, like I, I, I really do a sense that this, the, something great, you know, and it, I think it's a worldwide thing. Um, of course, not everybody is connected to the internet and has access in that way, but there's a growing population. But I see that the... Um, the potential to kind of shift the focus from a fear-based mentality to a solution and love-based mentality Mm -hmm. is something that we have to um, experience, you know, because we're so, it's so embedded. Mm -hmm. And so to me, the train would be that up is that opportunity of a circus of an experience, right. That smells good, tastes good, looks good. It feels good. Like it's something's working. Something makes me want to be like, I feel loved. I feel accepted. I feel, I feel like I can be myself. And that kind of passion um, is what needs to be woken up. That's like the, that's the untapped potential of, of humanity that I think is very dormant, you know, and you see this with like the opioid crisis and depression and how many people, like as much as we are becoming connected, we're also so disconnected mm-hmm. and we're realizing this more and more, you know? So what's the solution? What are the solutions to that? You know, I think it's like, yeah, how do we nourish ourselves? Mm-hmm. How do we take care of our bodies? How do we relate with each other and heal these like ancestral wounds and our familial stories so that we can move on, you know? Yeah, beautifully put. And I think it is happening. Like the amount of conversations I keep hearing like that, almost exactly like you said, in various manners, through podcasts, through festivals, through medicine journeys, through like it's happening so much. Like not too long ago, there would have been very little of that going on. You know, there was the 60s and 70s revolution, of course, which had its own beauty. Um, But it seems very new, the accessibility and the interconnectivity. I think you said it, like we've never been so disconnected, yet we've never been so connected as well. So it's this high, like high voltage time of so much potential, all these kind of like, 
almost tipping point or almost like for that many people to gather at a festival like Burning Man and to mm-hmm. have conscious conversation and to open, open their hearts and whatnot, like that is a potent energy that's happening maybe not to that scale but right now all around the world. You know, Perth where I mainly base uh, used to be regarded a very sleepy town and, you know, no one used to have access to any of this stuff but it's happening so much even here Mm. and Bali's another circuit. It's all kind of tied in this kind of international uh, web of conversations like this, which is like the, the train you're speaking of on a more subtle interconnected level. But there it is. You said it interconnected and you know, how train cars are linked together. Uh They're linked together by couplers that look like the, yeah. Right. And they push and they pull, you know, and I, to me, the train is, it, it's not an original idea that came to me. It's something, and maybe it is in itself an original idea, right? right? But I, as well as so many other people out there are seeing it, you know, and we're describing it in different ways. Mm-hmm. We, we are realizing our parts and uh, our roles to play in different ways right mm. and to me it's some it's a it's a it's like a wave that happens in culture it's in a wave that happens through time you know and that i think it's part of the wave that was really started in the 60s you know mm-hmm. and then for you know there was a lot of political stuff there was a lot of drama that happened that cut that off you know True. and made people turn away mm-hmm. i mean it's interesting because this is 2019 is the 50 year kind of mark of 1969. Mm -hmm. And I saw recently there was a Time Magazine special that came out. It's like a whole little book around 1969. And I leafed through it. I leafed through the whole thing (laughs) at the grocery store, you know, because it was fascinating to see what really, in an overview like that, what happened. And one of those, one of the big things that the media really grabbed onto was the Manson murders, Hmm. Charles Manson, because what, what came into that was, you know, the seek for spirituality and the guru. And then also the experimentation with psychedelics. And then all of that gone really bad. Right. You know, and there was a bunch of things like this in the war on drugs. There was a bunch of things that turned people, everyday people made them really scared and was like, nah, this is, we should, <laughs> let's step away from this. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure that's, that's just one, one small thing, um, maybe big thing within it all. But, you know, there, there, was, there was a reason why there was this like revolution, but it was kind of haphazard or it was kind of reckless. I think that's the right word. Yeah, well put, yeah. Somewhat reckless. And now over the past 50 years, there have been a bunch of people though in the background maybe not so much in the foreground that have been doing a lot of work, mm-hmm. you know, like the, the uh, organization maps for an exa- example, and Rick Doblin mm-hmm. who founded maps, um, the multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies. They're now doing really incredible work that is sanctioned by the federal government working with, you know, uh, helping PTSD mm-hmm. uh, military and um, police force and all kinds of people and really experimenting with how um, MDMA and all these things that have been demonized, you know, by the war on drugs um, and also plant medicines, you know, that, so there's, there's so many different angles that are coming to a head mm-hmm. at, at this time again. Right. And then you look at also the, how things are heating up in the political um, level and that's kind of uh, it's an interface um of the people i mean that's kind of what it's meant to be right so it's it's when there's a presidential election you know more people are coming out and paying attention than they do otherwise Mm. you know and so there's more discourse potential though there is also like a total um uh control force around the media yeah. that most people don't even realize, you know? And it's like, it's, 
it, it's wild. I mean, I think the more you uncover things and go down the path of, of curiosity um, rather than complacency, mm-hmm. um, you find you find a lot. And but it's so hard to know what to believe. <laughs> oh, <know>? totally. <laughs> It depends what channel you turn on, depends what bubble on, on social media you're locked in with. It, it's very interesting in how that can feed our own ideas and our own hypocrisies. And it, it's very interesting. It takes a lot of discernment to not get sucked into our own bubble, really. Like, because we can just reinforce our own delusion, illusion. So it's Mm -hmm. been a practice for me to like be aware of that bubble and appreciate the bubble. I love my bubble. At the same time, like (laughs) peek into other bubbles and um, see what's going on beyond that bubble Mm. and and making that a kind of meditation of like inner inner and outer like sacred activism, you know, like seeing where I get righteous and where I get uh, extreme or judgmental. And like really seeing where I get stuck in my separateness, really. And making that a yoga practice, a meditation of like seeing, seeing as much as I can, seeing where I get stuck and also seeing where I get uh, obsessed because it can be an easy uh, trap to, because we've just got so much information available and there's so many fucking channels and it can become an obsession and there's a whole like thing of people just kind of entranced in their phone, just scrolling through everything because it's endless almost. And, um, (laughs) and that can, that can be paralyzing as well. Huh? So it's like, it's a very fine balance. It seems to get informed and, and expand our awareness to everything that's going on. Without getting, uh, without it rattling us into absolute dysfunction. Otherwise, like, what's the point? <laughs> well, I think I. I mean, I bounce between all of that myself. Yeah, same. You know, and and that's I mean, why it's a and, yoga practice for sure. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, the whole I, I, the relationship with social media, for an example. You know, it's like I see and I've experienced so much good through it. And connecting with people and, and, you know, having my art be a wonderful, um, you know, impact people in wonderful ways, or so they say. Oh, yeah. And, and then at, on the other hand, you know, getting sucked into that, like, endless scrolling and being like, mm-hmm. well, wait, where did just the last, like, hour go? Like, you know, it's... And you feel you feel like it's enriching you, and in maybe some ways there's something that you come across that does, mm-hmm. but it's so easy, it's so addicting. And I think that I think this is going to be an ever larger topic as you know, as time goes on, you know, and younger generations are also probably going to find other ways of of dealing with it when we see more and more of like what how it's. Um, affecting us you know just like the whole cigarette phase (laughs) true (laughs) yeah that was getting prescribed as a as a medicine really for a while (laughs) (laughs) well gosh i mean there is there's something very sacred about tobacco you know to some people but there's not you know the way that it was marketed and then all the chemicals to make you want more Mm -hmm. you know it's just it's it's insanity and there is like the same kind of insanity that's behind the marketing of, and, but it, it speaks to some kind of like part of our brain mm. that wants satisfaction, you know, yes. and is looking and it's like, and it's never going to fully be satisfied because, oh, there's something more, there's something more, maybe yeah. there's something else, you know? Yeah. It keeps yeah. coming up in nearly every podcast one way or another, that conversation, <laughs> Because it's such yeah. a phenomenon and such a mystery and so new and it's starting to get revealed uh, the more toxic effects of it. At the same time, what a precious platform. Like yeah. how, what a mystery. Like I'm fully unplugged here. 
you're on the other side of the world and we're connecting. Like it's such a, a few decades ago, this would have been just totally uh, futuristic, which it is futuristic, but just sure. completely imaginary and we're doing it. It's amazing. It's yeah. like you're here. Um, yeah. And then that other kind of shadowy, like addictive nature of it is very confusing because we do get, it's throwing our circuitry off and, and yeah. it, it gives us that little bit of feedback of like, okay, you're getting seen and you're getting approved and you're getting, or, or you're not. And that can, can become a, a vicious cycle as well. So um, getting out to like workshops and getting out to festivals and getting out seems to be crucial and huge yeah. for people because uh, it's a it's a huge sticky trap of feeling so connected i can just stay in my fucking lounge room all day and be connected with countless people why yeah. go anywhere and um there's some beautiful truth to that at the same time it can really become a trap huh so to circle back though to yeah. the train this right. is one of the yes, reasons please. why i saw the train is because I saw this great need that was that would come out of this era of connecting to put our hands in the dirt again together yeah. you know and to build things together again you know to be to be you know alive yeah. in space with others you know that's that's not um you know, so there's, I, I think it's the, it's the same kind of ebb and flow that, mm -hmm. that just is, you know, and that's part of, we're, we're in a learning, in a learning curve. And it's pointing out a lot of like pretty deep things around, you know, discipline and, um, and also, you know, how, how much are we attached to um, others' approval, you know, and, you know, it's exposing all of this in a pretty, in, pretty intense way mm -hmm. and and it's like all you have to do is kind of like check yourself and the more you know people are interested in becoming aware the harder it is to hide and you can then you know you may still be doing it right you may still be doing something that do doesn't benefit you but you become more aware of it mm -hmm. and then over time there is a higher chance that you're going to make you're going to train yourself into other habits we are trainable, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're but very we're not, trainable. We're not going to do it, though, without some kind of incentive or if we, you know, usually it's like sickness, some mm -hmm. kind of sickness, some kind of emergency, something that makes people change their habits, right? It's, it's yeah. so, and this is where, say, yoga or meditation practice or doing, doing anything that's actually really good for you is is often such a challenge we somehow find ways to make excuses around it right mm, yeah you know that book the um the war of art mm -hmm. by stephen pressfield yeah that's such a great one for you know totally just picking up at any old time and looking at and being like oh yeah yeah there's another one you know it's like it's this exposing I think we're we're really in this we're in a time of great exposure. Great exposure. Yeah. yeah. I mean that's what that's what Trump's doing, you know? Like we can we can bitch about him all we like, but it, it I remember a letter that one of Ramdas's students sent to him uh so, uh soon after Trump got elected. And it was a really there was a lot of wisdom in it that that we could feel as it was read aloud of like Trump's the culmination of, of everything we don't want to see, you know. It, it, he's, he's magnified it forth and, and it's, it's making us look, you said it, exposure. And it's like he's that catalyst of exposure and how, how close are we going to look at it? Are we just going to get fucking angry and, and create uh, the equivalent on the extreme far left which is happening, you know? Uh, I mean, that could be a way to work it out, could be, or maybe that'll gradually work its way to the center 
Or, I mean, what Ramdas does, and I speak a bit about that as well, is he, he literally has a, a fo- he has his puja table with all the great saint, saints and sages that he worships. And then there's Trump. And his practice is to create that sacred activism of like, I fucking hate him. How the fuck has he become our leader? Mm. But... What, what lesson can I get from it? Where can I grow? Where do I get stuck? And his practice is to, to love him mm. and to see like the, the, the soul and the multidimensional aspect of whew, he's showing us all our shit. Am I going to look at it? You know, and um, for me at first, it's hard to like really look at that clearly. I want to opposed I want to stay separate Mm. and then I I, or I want to bypass it and just say not like use a kind of spiritual um ultimacy of like no none of this is real and kind of go hang in my bubble you know (laughs) and that's exactly what um Marianne Williamson is calling out Right. You know, it's kind of she's also calling out these kind of, you know, the the new age crowd. <laughs> right. You know, in, yeah. from, uh, in a big way of like, you know, you're not just going to unmanifest it. <laughs> yeah. You know, like there's there's actual work and like face, you know, facing it to be done and not to I think to go back to, you know, how do you challenge uh you know, the, the current status quo, do you do it by taking an opposite, like, you know, play the same game and take a counter counterpoint, Mm -hmm. um, you know, to like counterpoint attack or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or do you like come from a completely different angle, you know, like a different, a different, a different game. Mm -hmm. And that different game is something that is, is not telling the other one, no, you're wrong. It's like, no, how about we, how about we try this, you know, a a different kind of solution. I I just like a lot of the debates and things like that, you know, within politics, they seem to just be telling each other, you know, doing a lot of like, you know, they're just trying to catch each other saying something wrong or, you know, it's so vicious. Mm -hmm. It's like, why the heck does it need to be so vicious? (laughs) <laughs> it's uh, I mean it just it just baffles me and I I feel like the you know we we need to face face things and I really like how you gave that description you know mm-hmm. with with Ram Ramdas and having mm-hmm. Trump there because we need to learn to love you know what what we don't yeah agree with and and through that love, because because hating something is going to create more hate. And if we find a way to also, you know, see the truth of like how it's not him so much as it is the system that has created him. Mm-hmm. You know, that's something that Marianne says. And that right. rings a lot, rings true. You know, it makes sense to me. And that's what we have to do is we have to find what makes sense to us and not just believe it. Mm-hmm. Because that's so dangerous, you know. We need to, we need, we need to speak from our hearts and from our experience, mm-hmm. and use that as our primary foundation of where we where we speak from. And when we share ideas that we've learned from other people, we make that clear that these are ideas that we think are interesting, but they're not beliefs, mm-hmm. you know. And that's. I think a lot of people grab on to um, a belief about something yeah. rather than uh, often because an authority figure has that we admire has, you know, in religion or in mm-hmm. politics or wherever. And uh, it's just, it's dangerous. I'm, I'm, I'm becoming more attentive to that these days. Yeah. Same. It's really beautiful hearing you speak really articulately like there's a there's a clarity there that's really refreshing not just not just blindly optimistic mm. not not cynical but just like paying attention a deep a deep paying attention which is really refreshing cuz you're 
not only are you having a lot of these conversations and holding workshops and you're in, in a kind of leadership role big time, uh, then what I love as well is then the transmission through art. Like mm-hmm. even just looking at, I keep getting lost in that piece behind you. I'm like, holy crap, like, wow. It's just, it's a powerful transmission, the, all the, uh, this art and beauty and uh, a transmission that can get us beyond just thinking about it and like wrestling with it just with the mind into a deeper felt experience, which can be felt through conversation eventually yeah. if we're paying close enough attention. But then like the music that's getting made and the, the, the visionary art and the experiential mystical journeys that are becoming more and more skillfully held, that, that feels exciting to me as well. Like a direct experience. I often think like imagine if all these leaders before they open their fucking mouth <laughs> were able to like sit in a circle mm. and either, I don't know, either have some MDMA and have like they could do it in a really Western format, you know, a psychotherapist, a psychologist and like yeah. it, it could be – it could happen. Who knows? Like the way it's going, it's kind of come full circle into more of a clinical way. And they're like being held. But before you become leader or before you like go into um, campaigning to be leader, you got to sit down and all yes. have a conversation, like a proper conversation. And let, let just to assist that, let's have some MDMA or some psilocybin <laughs> And like, just get real. Sometimes I fantasize on that possibility and how I think that could cut to the chase, you know? I mean, that's a, that's a very, very sober, I would say a very sober suggestion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's not new, you know? No. This, this is, we, we've just gotten away from it, yeah, you know? Exactly. And there are more and more people waking up mm-hmm. that are in all sectors of, society that are seeing and realizing that there are other ways, you know, and I, I did a podcast recently, um, an interview with, um, uh, it's called the space between mm-hmm. and, uh, this guy, Joey and, um, and, uh, the two, Eric Donaldson, um, they are, so they're they've, they're doing these these benefits that are that are going to help build awareness and raise funds for um, I think various organizations, but one that they're really interested in is helping educate medical professionals around spiritual awakenings that are diagnosed as mental health right um, breaks right where they're having and people are being medicated and mm. you know they're. They're not, you know, they don't, the, the medical industry hasn't been trained, um, so I guess officially, you know, some that have an open mind and have, a, a, you know, a connection with, with meditation or yoga um, or some kind of like alternative um, medicines mm. that, you know, could help people. Um, with spiritual spiritual awakenings because they can they can be kind of brutal sometimes yeah. um, and I, and Joey went through one of these breaks and ended up in a mental institution and and his whole journey has triggered him to um, to create this and you know I feel really inspired and and interested in supporting these kinds of initiatives mm-hmm. that are are around really helping educate. Um, families and or just educate people around other op, you know other ways of approaching this um, yeah. these kinds of things because and there's also you know there's so many people that are incarcerated that are you know <laughs> just there's so much insanity when I look at and I think I've always kind of seen this as as a child I was brought up pretty alternative and um, my parents spoke you know, as they saw, saw the world too, you know, they weren't hiding anything 
and they they had woken up pretty early on too and you know i just you know grew up seeing that and just being kind of like what the, <laughs> this is ridiculous well i guess we're just going to i'm i'm just going to function over here in some little bubble and find a way you know and and then and we do as we go along we find our niches we find our um support systems and um but you know but then you go out. I mean, for me, it's like I, I do I, as well as you, I'm sure, you know, we bounce around between festivals and workshops and places where a lot of people are, are attracted that have a similar way of uh, similar interest, interests, you know. So it's kind of like there are a lot of my experiences that are, you know, they're so harmonious and, <laughs> you know, healthy food and, you know, people yeah. that are interested in all those kinds of interactions. But then there's, you know, I go out into, into an international airport, you know, or uh, places into a supermarket or, or there are various places of inter- intersection, you know, and you're like, wow, there's so much, there's so much, so many other bubbles. <laughs> yeah. And we just, I, I, I feel there's just a responsibility and maybe all the bubbles feel that like, <laughs> like we got to convert the others and that may, may be part of you know, a problem. Oh, for sure. And it's not so much like a converting, <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't want to convert anybody. Mm-hmm. I'm not like a missionary. I don't feel like that, but I do yeah. like there's certain things that are just basic fundamental things. And <laughs> I mean, living foods and I mean... <laughs> I mean, just that, you mentioned the supermarket, just that insanity of like 99% of the shopping center, most of them anyway, is just absolute garbage. Like yeah. garbage. And that's become normalized. Yeah. And I mean, awareness is spreading a- a- around that, but... Even that is pretty mind blowing. Well, it's just like just alone, like the costs of things. You know, mm-hmm. like good healthy food just costs so much more. You know, yeah. that's 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 one of the things that could really, you know, should should be one of the shifts. Um, I am this property that I'm on here in Colorado. Mm. Uh, my partner started developing um, uh, ten over 10 years ago, it's the old sawmill of an old Western town. Oh, and cool. It's half of a city block. And, um, it's been, he's been turning it into an artifactory, um, and, uh, a place to facilitate change. And it's not, it's a, it's got workshops for metal wood. It's got a salvage yard to collect, you know, uh, materials that would normally be taken to the dump or something mm. that, that can be reused and used to fix things to, uh, so it's a kind of like a glorified junkyard and we also have gardens here. And the reason why I segued into that is because yeah. we also have, um, a nonprofit it's, uh, that is located here and runs, um, their CSA program. Beautiful. Um, from here, the community supported agriculture and, mm. and links together small farms and the schools have farms in this valley. Um, and it's, you know, it's such a, it's a different thing to be eating food from your region. Yeah. Thank and, you for segueing um, it to that. That's so exciting. Part. Yeah. That's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I'm and seeing that more really, and more really, as well. Yeah, it's, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's definitely catching on. um, And it's one of those kinds of things where it doesn't matter your political beliefs or your religious beliefs or whatever. It's food. Yeah. (laughs) And we all like good food. And Mm -hmm. to teach little children, I love, I just, I had these little children here a couple weeks ago, you know, we're picking some carrots from the garden and we're picking, you know, peas and, lettuce and you know every, they're all talking about what they like and what they what they don't like so much and and the difference you know we had a little conversation about the difference between eating a carrot that's that fresh mm. you know or some or some greens is that fresh you just picked it compared to if it had been picked say four or five days ago and you bought it in the grocery store mm. you know and the life force that's in it and then you taste it and you eat it and you're like hmm 
yeah, that does taste really good. Yeah. You know, and it's like, this is, let's speak to just logic, you know, and that's, that's the kind of, I, I really love those moments. <laughs> it's so those, beautiful. And then yeah. getting your feet in the earth, getting your hands dirty, connecting to the earth. I mean, it's so therapeutic and kind of cycling back to where we we're at before. It, it does feel like one of the most practical and just powerful antidotes to all of this uh, the mysterious phone and technology usage, exactly. just putting the phone down for a bit, getting our hands in the soil, eating from yeah. the earth. Uh, for many of us, it takes a bit of organizing, you know, if we live in a city or it's just not readily available, you got, yeah. you got to be pretty organized of like, okay, it's been a week or two since we've done anything like that. Let's let's have a technology free day or something like that and get out into the mountains. And for many, it takes that kind of um, discipline. Yeah. Back yeah. to discipline again. Mm -hmm. But this is one of the things that I see the train bringing. Yeah. The train is going to bring the tools and the troops, mm -hmm. you know, to build gardens and regenerative centers of gathering mm. visionary hospitals. Um, yeah places and, and and the hospital isn't where just sick people go no it's like it's a place it's hospice you know it's like it's it's where you come you gather as well you know mm -hmm. you can gather in health you know and to and this is another part of the whole thing it's like let's not just treat um treat the the symptoms you know let's go deeper into why are people actually getting sick you know and it's education and it's education not, you know, and if that, that education is not being broadcasted because the investment interests of, of the corporations don't want that news to get out, you know, and that's, that's the reality of the situation, you know. So what, what other alternatives do we have to share this information? And this is, mm -hmm. so I've, I've been very interested in alternative festivals and gatherings you know, that have been going on for a long time and are increasing all the time where music festivals are, are becoming, you know, art and workshop and, you know, there, there's so much more involved now. Mm -hmm. um, and community, you know, there's a, a lot more for children. And um, these are really, really important. And I think it's a part of community building where people are coming together and they're, they're building their visionary little towns and cities, you know, that are, that are, um, you know, only there for a short period of time and then everything gets broken down. Um, but I think this is all training wheels, uh, for, for building, for leaving a trace, mm -hmm. you know, Burning Man, that's one of the, the top, um, values nice, or yeah. priorities at Burning Man is leave no trace. Mm -hmm. And, um, I feel that what's going to birth out of that is, is this flourishing um, example of, of a community that's ready to leave a trace and to help communities that are ready for that, mm. to do that. And the, you know, the companies, the, the visionaries, the, the, the funders, the, the experts, all these people are getting ready for this to happen. And it's going to happen all over the world. Like it's it, when, you know, there's, there's, there's a certain kind of like resonance that's, that, that will happen, you know, and then it will, it will, you know, one, there'll be one thing that'll start over here and then another one, another one, another one. And the thing is, is that it's not just going to start, like it's already happening. And that's something that you said before. And that's like a huge theme, like to remember that it is already happening. Like, mm -hmm. and that was something that I heard at Burning Man over and over and over again. I made me laugh when he said that earlier, because I was like, you know, this is such a theme right now. It's already happening. And these like train stations, these visionary stations that are, you know, main, um, major parts of, of communities, they do already exist. Some of them are, are, you know, you know, not as maybe fleshed out or not, not, you know, there are initiatives, maybe put it that way and, and centers and places around the world, mm -hmm. you know, culture houses. And I've been a part of one of them in Vienna, Austria, 
I lived in Europe for 11 years and was a part of this, and I still am, but I'm not there as much anymore. It's, a, it's actually an old locomotive factory. Um, it's called the VUK, W-U-K, short. Um, and I would say anybody listening to this, you know, check it out if you're interested in visionary culture and culture houses and you know, alternative places of gathering. This is a, a, a fantastic example mm. um, where there's alternative schools, there's um, workshops, you know, for all kinds of, you know, there's a huge wood workshop, metal workshop, um, photography studios, mm. artist workshops, um, places for um, marginalized cultural um, ethnic groups to gather, dance and theater. There's a, there's a, a big theater hall and concert hall, restaurant. Wow. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And this place is fascinating. 12,000 huh. square meters of alternative culture in the heart of Vienna. And that's, this place is actually under threat right now from the current government again who doesn't actually really see the value, you know, they, Mm. it's like, no, you guys got to pay. You got to (laughs) pay. You can't, you can't be uh, special in your cultural activities. Um, Mm. You know, and it's, it's constantly been under threat. Right. But these kinds of places breed a kind of culture. Uh, You know, it's a place where people can come and, and, you know, hash out how can we how can we work in community um in new ways and i learned so much there around being um around decision making in communities you know different ways of of um of coming to decisions uh fascinating wow Um, but you know this really uh, to me it's part of this bigger picture that i'm really interested in is seeing places like this, even, even greater expanded, you know, developments and using, taking, you know, one of the ideas is taking these old industrial kind of ruins, Mm -hmm. you know, that were built by the industrial revolution and turning them into, you know, regenerative community centers Mm. where, you know, that's where you could go to get your, pick up your produce. <laughs> That's where you go and do your yoga class. That's where you go and, you know, where your children are in the play group or, That's you know. That's super beautiful. How inspiring. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. I'm seeing a lot it's, around here. Um, a kind of honesty, uh, an honesty um, system of like people having their, their gardens and whatnot, and then leaving a few boxes out on their verge or out on their fence of like an honesty box. If you can afford to give some cash for the produce, leave it in here. If you can't, pay back when you can, if you can. And that's been really refreshing and beautiful as well. Yeah. Just little tokens of we're all in it together, you know? That's the, the, also the gifting economy, which is one of the economy. Yeah. That you learn at Burning Man. And as Mm -hmm. much as people will rant about it, and especially also, I mean, in, in light of the Amazon burning, you know, there was a lot of anger that I saw come up on the internet and spoke to people too, you know, around like, well, why are they burning this crazy, all this stuff out in the desert? you know, when the Amazon is burning and there is a lot of contradiction there too, but I can't say that I I really agree with necessarily Mm -hmm. either, but there is, there is another aspect of Burning Man that to me overweighs um, those other aspects to make me maybe decide to not go, you know? Right. Um, And it is the community, this experience of, of community and this experience of, well, what happens to when you build something completely new, that environment, that experimental environment of community is something that we really need to experience. And even though I've been 11 times, like every time I go back, I learn so much more and I see so much deeper into the potentials, I feel like, of humanity. And the gifting is such a, I mean, when we're not trying to sell things to each other or trying to, you know, 
wow, it's so there's so much more kindness and there's so much more abundance. I mean, it just really, it feels that way. I mean, there's just, there, I, I do feel that there is enough to go around. It's just so, just the way it's set up, it's hard to imagine that that's true. Yeah. Yeah. But the earth is so abundant. I, I to, to take the, start baby steps, start with a little plant, you know, mm-hmm. like in your window that, that, you know, whatever, for whatever light scenario you have and stuff and build that relationship. And, you know, it will, it will continue. If the prayer is there, it will continue to grow and being a part yeah. of, you know, people in cities, there's a lot of great community gardens and they yeah. just have, you have to look for them though, mm-hmm. you know, it's not like it's just going to happen upon <laughs> happen to you. You know, you kind of have to just do it. It's becoming it. it's becoming more <laughs> evident, though, isn't it? It's becoming a bit more like in yeah. your face when I fly into cities and seeing the the rooftop gardens and the the vertical gardens. It, it, it's it's there. It's unavoidable yeah. almost now, which gives a lot of hope yeah. to. We just got to keep going. You know, yeah. it's a long game. It's mm-hmm. not, there's, there's, there's not a short, quick answer, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, it's going to take all different, you know, it's going to take all our different perspectives mm-hmm. and all of our different, because this is, this is one thing that I think is very true is that we are all unique angles. This is my partner, Joe Bob Merritt. He's, he said, I have this from him that we are all unique angels. You know, it's the same etymological root yeah. angles and angles of of, ah, of like the that. great spirit you know of this like great experience experiment experience you know and we're you know no one can do the same thing as as another in exactly the same way you know so it's like if i make a mark with a brush or with a pencil you know, maybe just one little dot. Okay. That could be, you know, <laughs> somebody else could repeat that, but I do 50 dots, you know, no, no one else is going to do that the same mm-hmm. or lines or however that is. And that's one thing that we don't realize how unique we are because we were kind of indoctrined early on, you know, that mm-hmm. in some weird way that maybe you're not special, you know, that you're not, you're, you're not good at that. I mean, I've, I come across so many people that come to my workshops that have that have at some point been traumatized. And I think a majority of adults have been. I agree. Around creativity, especially, mm-hmm. you know, that it's like, oh no, because it's been so attached to being a, um, you know, like that's going to be your profession. And it doesn't have to be, you know, like the, the value of art is, is so beyond, uh, a profession, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's, and it's, that it's turned into that is kind of, is, is pretty sad, actually. It, it, it competes. I think it's a, it's a competing force of actual, the, the real creative spirit that mm-hmm. it wants to be totally free and that yeah. needs to be free, you know, and that is a, a conduit of, of spirit, you know, and uh, you were, kind of looking at this piece behind me, you know, it's like, oh, this kind of draws me in. And that, to me, that, that resonance, that, that energy behind the prayer of, mm. uh, of a piece of art that is intended to be something that is of, of inspiration, you know, of uplift, that brings upliftment to others. You know, that's sacred art. And there's, there's, sacred art has become, you know, because of the commodification of art, you know, there's first you see the price tag. First you want to, you know, first you're first it's, it's being sold to you Mm. before you appreciate it. Right. True. And that's like, you know, in, in museums, maybe you don't, or you go into a temple, you go into a church, that's where you're going to see work. That's not, trying to be sold to you. Mm-hmm. But what's of the new sacred art and where do we see that? You know, where is that? And I think a lot of that, there is um, a whole movement of a contemporary sacred art that has been coming through the kind of underground uh, culture mm-hmm. that is a worldwide phenomenon 
that is being exhibited at, at uh, festivals, you know, and totally. that's, that's visionary art. Mm -hmm. And the visionary art has started to seep out into the mainstream, you know, and has, you know, is being exhibited in some yeah, larger galleries. And there are some museum collections that are showing visionary art, um, but it's barely just beginning. You know, it's still, it's been a counterculture thing, you know, that's been inspired by spirituality, by psychedelics, you know, and um, these have been real taboo subjects in academics for many years. How yeah. did you get into visionary art? Well, I think, <clears throat> let's see, I, you know, it's, I found, I learned about the term mm -hmm. um, when I found out about Alex Gray, which was in the mid 2000s, early 2000s. Um, I, had, I had already gone to, I'd been invited to study, at, um, to be an apprentice to this artist, Michael Fuchs in, in Austria, um, straight out of high school. I was 18 <laughs> and I think I was actually 19 when I went for like my two year study with him. And, um, I, I had been, uh, inspired by the transcendentalists in school. I had, I had seen a lot of visionary artwork also because of my high school art teacher, Hikaru Hirata, who's a Japanese fantastic realist. And this was in Boulder, Colorado. I was in the Shiny Mountain Waldorf School, first graduating class in 1996. And we had a lot of really cool opportunities because it was such a new school. Um, but it was, I, I was definitely um, introduced to some artwork and it was poetry that inspired me. I was the Renaissance that really inspired me. And I think also, you know, these ideas of like what, what of peace and of, um, well, how would we get there and how would we find healing? You know, these were things that my, my family was interested in as well. My mother being a big activist as well. Um, so I, I ended up working then with this artist, Ernst Fuchs, who was my teacher's father and I became his assistant and I worked with him for 10 years on and off on all kinds of projects. There were times, months at a time that I would take off. And then there were times where I would be months on, you know, 24 seven, pretty much helping him with, with life and the crazy, the crazy life that he led <laughs> and doing a lot of paintings. And he was a great mystic. He's uh, Alex Gray points to him as being one of, one of the godfathers of visionary art. And he was one of the founders of the School of Fantastic Realism, along with um, three or four of his, of his friends in Vienna, Austria, right after Second World War. And um, they were kind of interested in a, um, in, in a, as fantastic realism, they were interested in exploring kind of these like dreamlike, subtle, um, mystical realms also Fuchs did a lot of things that he that were inspired a lot of works that were inspired by the bible and and different uh mystical texts i mean he was very very well read um and interested in in the broader spectrum of spirituality and I think his work, you know, he had a lot of different artists that came and sought him out and studied with him. Uh, he never was an official professor at the um, academy there in, in Vienna, but he did have his own, he had a castle outside of Vienna. <laughs> and, and in kind of like an old school manner, um, had, you know, young artists would come and, and study with him and, and work with him. And he, he taught, he passed down this method, this technique that he had revived, um, mostly inspired from this book by Max Derner, Materials of the Artist. An early Renaissance method of layering and developing a painting through um, light layers and then color and in, in thin glazes. 
And this, he developed kind of a method, I think, uh, and this is what I observed of, of a channeling through, uh, through the brush and through this method of say working with just the white because when he would paint when he would paint with uh developing values he would use just white and that white you know in all its um gradations of optical mm-hmm. grays and he, and you and you go into a different state almost with it like there's this ability to tap into um some almost like a trance like state and i think in general with art making and music you know it's not like just this technique or anything. But I think this technique and what I've discovered through the years of working with it and why I've continued working with it is because it has helped me discover and go deeper into into realms that I could have never imagined. Hmm. Because I, I start a painting with an idea kind of, or like a feeling usually, like I'll have a sense of direction. But then I allow the peace to guide me. And that's something that I also learned through working with him. And yet, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a never ending journey. <laughs> Amazing. I could go on it. <laughs> Please do. All, I mean, as I look at that, I, enc- I encourage people listening to, um, look at the video version because I'm just tripping out as I listen to Amanda looking at her beautiful piece of art behind her just as she describes the the journey of creating the art you can you can look at the video and really really experience it I mean there's such an aliveness to your work that is so rare like it looks it looks unreal it looks truly truly multi-dimensional and that, that word does get thrown around a lot and one experiences it. Yeah. But it's so cool to see something open-eyed in this 3D world that really invites us into that multidimensional yeah. experience. And your work really, really does invoke that and evoke that it's like this inner and outer experience it's super powerful yeah well it's like uh, thank you <laughs> appreciate that well, you know I, it. it's, <laughs> it's like uh it's the it's i think alex alex says you know they're alex gray that the paintings are you know our records our records of our memories of the places we've been mm. you know and I, they're not so much to me, like, as I said before, they're not what I, you know, have seen. And I'm, I'm totally trying to recreate that. Like that's very rarely, that, do, that doesn't really happen to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's more that I, I, I find so much more possibility and space with the, with just, you know, showing up to the canvas Mm. and having a system. And I think the system that I, that guide, that I allow to guide me frees me from, from, you know, it's like the path keeps going, even though I don't know, like I, I don't quite know what's going to happen right there or, you know, especially down the line. And I don't need to know that, Mm. you know, at some point though, there is a point where you get to where you're like, okay, this painting, eh, it's, I got to put a different hat on. And that different hat is the technician, Hmm. you know, and we need, and this is where a lot of, I think, visionary artists get stuck. This is what I see with a lot of work. When people are trying to express something they've experienced or an emotion or a feeling, something they've seen in their inner, inner mind, you know, they want to, they want to bring it out. So to maybe, just meditate on it for themselves. Maybe they want to, you know, there's all different reasons why we create art. And that's mm-hmm. something that we need to consider too, very deeply that it doesn't need to be something that's for everyone else. You know, it's considered maybe it's something that's for you. Maybe it's something that's for somebody else. Maybe it just needs to be made and burned for the experience, you know, of that creation and, you know, and, and then death. But 
we need to um the that when we when we are looking to create something we bring it out in a, in the best way possible but then we get stuck <laughs> mm-hmm. with it being maybe not exactly what you thought or what you saw and then you start to judge it and you know there's always that point but taking it to a point of actually being where where it could really be stand on its own completely mm-hmm. you know and be like okay this because that's a, that's a huge question. People ask me this: How do you know when a painting's finished? Right. You know, um, and there's so many different things, <laughs> ways that I'll answer that at times. But there is a there is a place that a piece could be finished at almost any phase of its development, and that's what I like to look for, and that's what I want to help train people to look for, and that's a harmonic, mm. and that harmonic is based on very simple principles, you know, and it doesn't matter what your content is. It doesn't matter any of that, but these three basic principles are something that I learned from Ernst Fuchs as well. And they're they're so basic. I mean, they're probably in every art book, but one, one of the first, the first is composition, right? And that's how within your, like behind me, I have this, you know, it's a rectangle canvas, you know, where is your, alignment of your of your subject matter you know all of this plays a role in the harmonics of of the piece and how it reads if you look at a tanka painting like the tibetan tanka paintings they are very very specific in their mathematical layout Mm -hmm. and it's all based on sacred geometry it's all based on 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 how uh, uh, thousands of years (laughs) of of developing the the framework for what the intention is behind these works and um the so so composition and uh very important there's so much to be said about that but then to go into the next is uh your light and dark your your balance between light and dark and also where your attention is drawn you know light will the, the brightest point in a piece is where your eye is automatically going to go first many times. And so how, do, how is that play and how is that balanced? And then color. And so, and how is the color balanced? So you can look at a painting, you know, and be like, okay, this painting's sick. What are we going to do? And then get out of your emotional bit, you know, of kind of like also projecting where do I want? No, it doesn't look like I wanted it to look. You know, right. that's one of the big things. It's like, well, what does the painting want? Maybe, maybe consider that you've created something huh. out, of, out of your inspiration that is not yours. And it is something completely uh, has its own mission. And if you were only to actually really be in service to it, mm-hmm. then you could maybe hear what it needs to harmonically, you know, find that point of resonance. So when it's fit you know, you can reach that finished point, people can, you know, then it creates that sense of awe mm-hmm. and captivation and people don't know why. Why is that? You know, and it's, not, I, I don't claim to achieve that in all my work, but I aim for it. Right. It sounds <laughs> you know. also like a kind of metaphor for life as well. That seems like quite the practice to, be artful with life in terms of intentionality and high vision and clarity, paying attention, and then kind of getting out of the way and asking, where, I don't know, where's my soul taking me or where, where, where am I meant to go? Rather than overriding all of that more subtle dimensionality. It seems as you were speaking, that's like a, a great recipe for an awesome day and an awesome life, you know? <laughs> oh, so true. Yeah. Oh. And I was also thinking of like... I do. I, I mean, I, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I, I mean, I've realized through the workshops that this is so true. Mm-hmm. That the painting is really a metaphor yeah. for life. Yeah. Like, and then the the... the knowing when to bring in the technician, you know, and refining and 
having some skills, it definitely like having the, those skills, but then getting out of the way and, uh, and asking like, what does this want from me? Yeah. How yeah. can I be of service? How can I be of service? Yeah. Yeah. Instead of, you know, being of service, this is another thing that I've, the difference between service and seeking mm-hmm. is interesting. Um, yeah. You know, and that's, this goes back to a story that Joe Bob also talks about uh, uh, the grail, the Holy grail mm-hmm. and how the story that we mostly have know, you know, is that the, the, the grail knights were seeking the grail because it was hidden. But that story has been changed <laughs> over time. And the original story, the grail is not something that is hidden. Mm-hmm. The Holy Grail is the earth herself. And the Grail Knights were in service of her. Yeah. And that changes the whole thing so much, you know? Like how, how, why did they hide it? So that we would be disconnected so that we would be seeking it, looking for something outside of ourselves to fulfill us flash to market all the marketing schemes Mm -hmm. and everything, all of the the manufacturing, manufacturing of desire. Yeah. I often like (laughs) yo-yo between that thought that they hit it on purpose or and I yo-yo to the other contemplation of did did we hide it? Like it's kind of a game of hide and seek, like Alan Watts would say. It's a game of hide and seek. And we we actually hit it as God. And we're kind of to make life interesting, you know, our kind of soul's journey. And we're yeah. finding it again. Yeah. To, to just get out of the get out of the victim seat. No one hid it from oh. us. We hid it ourselves. <laughs> I love that. I'm so yeah. glad that you brought that in because that's something that I feel I easy, I can hear or point out when I hear it from somebody else, mm-hmm. right? Like the, I'm becoming more and more sensitive to the they thing. Yeah, yeah. And when I when I'm caught doing it, oh, whew, that's that's a see, it's language. It's like in language. us. Yeah. You know, as well, and like it's there's so much that we may think like in in moments when we're when we're feeling more conscious or we're being you know we're kind of like up on a platform like right now we're recording mm-hmm. <laughs> you know you you try to pay more attention right. to your to what you're saying, but there's so much that comes out that's maybe even not so intended, but it's like programmed like yeah. <laughs> we're pretty programmed totally. Yeah. And that's happening a lot as well, that re, reframing of language, which yeah. catches me out every now and then. It, it can actually be kind of annoying, like how, um, <laughs> how thickly programmed just certain words. I was like, fuck, I wasn't meaning that at all. But right. the languaging is, is pretty important. It's kind of how we... There is a, a, a perception in how we also language things. It's very interesting to observe. It's all getting reframed. Yeah, we're in for it, you know. <laughs> but it's, I, I feel excited about it, you know. It's, so do it's I. It's opportunity, you know. Yeah. It's like, and that's, you know, there's, I guess for those that feel threatened, you know, I, I, I want to find easier ways of softening that, you know? So that's where I'm not so much interested in the debate as I'm interested in collaborating. Collaborating. Yeah. Yeah. And even if we don't agree on every single fucking thing, it's okay. We can still talk. We can go beyond the story, go beyond the divide. And the more I see that, that that's one of the main things that really does excite me to see people from opposing uh, tribe, so to speak, kind of come yeah. together into a deeper interconnectivity, back to the train thing, you know, and we are all walking each other home, you know. Yeah, that's that's why I think the circus is such a great yeah. thing. It's like, who doesn't want to go to the circus and see see cool stuff, you know, yeah. and, and, and go to, you know, 
eat good food and mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean art and music and yeah. food all of these things like bring us together and I think you know if we focus on that we, we let the cultural you know we let the artists lead the way and so we'll we'll have a good time and it will then and it's such a great distraction maneuver I think from the from the fear mm-hmm. paradigm you know and it's like let's let's experience what it is to step out of time and into time in a different way mm. And that's where the train is another, you know, really major symbol with time because the train brought us time um, in the way that we use it now because we didn't need time before it. You know, stopwatches, (laughs) the the pocket watches and conductors were the first ones that had the pocket watches. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited for this, the, the vision train project. I feel in the next couple months I'm going to be spending um, a lot more time invested in getting this platform online awesome of visiontrain.org we already have a, an Instagram page where there's a bunch of little oh cool where can people find that vision train just okay. like a vision train on Instagram right <laughs> and um, I, I look forward to uh, putting together a little program to help train con- train conductors Mm-hmm. to be able to facilitate the vision train That's project so cool. in That's schools exciting. and their communities all over the world that can then be uploaded into the system and connect with everybody else's cars. Beautiful. Um, and it's, yeah. Do you want me to show you one? Please I have do. to go get it real quick. Yeah, please do. It's right over here. Take me a second. Yeah. It's so funny. I had all the, the I, I will. <laughs> I had all these questions lined up to ask Amanda, but it's just been so good vibing with the free-flowing conversation. She's so full of inspiration. I was just telling the listeners, Amanda, that I had um, all these questions just beautifully lined up to ask you, but it's like I haven't had any need to ask them. You're just so full of inspiration and creativity. It's been a great just free flow. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I think we covered, uh, like, a... we covered like two of the questions, but that's awesome. I love that. Oh, gosh. Well, we can do this again anytime. Yeah, we'll do it again. We'll see how the resonance is. Yeah. So I, I um, brought, this is, I have a whole stack of these from Burning Man. And um, they've got dust all over them. <laughs> but this is, let's see, here's one. All right. For those of you listening. I am seeing, for starters, go on the YouTube version and have a look. Okay, so the train carriage. So it's um, a train car and then there's, a, I think it's like a light bulb or like a little, like... Uh, like a, a, it almost looks like, yeah, like a light bulb or what are those... Um, oh, those little like snow orbs. Yeah, things. yeah, yeah, with a tree in it. <laughs> And it's got a tree or a little plant sprouting That's in it. really cool. And then on the back, people are invited to share their, um, share their vision and words. And mm. it says, I dream of a world where everyone is free to be themselves. Yeah. And this is actually, this is Olivia Jane. And she's an amazing artist as well. And, and so, so people are then invited to, to give their information if they would like to link their vision into the train. And then here's another one that says thrive Thrive. cool as waves and as plants and it has and it says on the back i envision healthy oceans and clean drinking water for all the time will come when the health of our water sources are the top priorities of our governments and world leaders i have a vision of the planet coming in to coming in and returning to the forefront of guidance for the human race Oh, uh-huh. yeah. It was by Kelsey Rhodes. Yeah, Kelsey. You know, so, so this I've collected about a thousand, close to a thousand of these over the past wow. two years. Huh. And I, I'm going to be counting them next week. Um, I have a friend that's going to come and help me really document them all properly. And wow, um, we're going to be taking the next, next, going to the next phase. But I think once we really can have this online and some videos. Mm. Um, sharing you know the story where they could, it could just be played for a group of people um that we can quickly build this um 
and it can be a part of, there's a lot of other projects that are similar um, that could add this into their programs. And um, it's, a, it's, it's one way to, see, it's, it's one thing to collect these. And I've, I've, I've told people, I was like, look, I'm, I'm um, volunteering to be the guardian of these and to, to make sure that they come together and are, are you know, um, held safe and then that something happens with them, mm-hmm. right? And that it's also a way of, of people... Um, as I said in the beginning, kind of like deepening their own ideas of what is important to them and to consider what their puzzle piece is, what their role is. And I, I've, I'm also inviting people to, um, I would like to see a way for them to revisit their train car. Mm -hmm. And I've also said that you don't have to make just one, you can make as many as you want and to continue to develop the vision, you know, like, and let's keep, let's, let's go on this journey and let's, let's start now and now and now again to, to, and not wait, you know, to ask these questions and to do what we can individually, you know, because that's going to create a momentum, you know, that's going to, you know, there's, you know, a train is actually usually it's pulled by a locomotive. Right. And I, I, we need to have a locomotive for sure made from clean energy. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, But there's the momentum of the cars is what I see propelling this. Right. You know, it's like the momentum of the, the energy of the, that's just like each little car, you know, and we're each, we're each little cars, you know, and our, the more clear we become and the more we, are are curious and going and, and not settling for for something you know it's like no let's go deeper let's let's get become more um available you know for to to be conduits and to be available to the best possible outcome of every situation you know harmonic vessels that create, that uplift the energetics of our surroundings and wherever we are. And that becomes contagious. You become somebody that people want to be around, you know, that you get invited back places, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's, you know, that's not that, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Let's, we look towards solutions or we can look towards critique. Mm-hmm. And we do definitely need to, to look towards critique and be, um, you know, be realistic, Mm -hmm. but let's not spend the majority of our time there. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Amazing. Super exciting. Amanda, is there anything else you're vibing off and wanting to share with the listeners, any upcoming appearances or offerings or anything you want to let the listeners know about? Well, I am going back to Cosm, the Chapel of Sacred Mirrors, to Great. teach my eighth, eighth annual um, painting workshop there. Wonderful. Um, and that's in October. We do have a full class there. But um, one thing I do want to mention that I'm very excited about, mm-hmm. and it's something for people to look up if they don't know about this already, it's um, this, this incredible uh, new phenomenon. It's not a new phenomenon, but it is something that is now making a lot, a big splash is this group called Meow Wolf. Okay. Meow, like a cat. I'll take note. W, and then wolf, like, okay. like a wolf. <laughs> yeah, I haven't and, heard. So thank you. I'll check it out. So look up Meow Wolf. Uh, Meow Wolf is a, was started in Santa Fe, New Mexico as a group of artists coming together looking for it to create interactive um, experimental environments. And um, they're, they're a real interesting group of people. There's an amazing documentary that they made um, about their, their becoming and their story. And um, they've, they built this uh, place in Santa Fe that's called the House of Eternal Return. That was made out of it's, it's in an old bowling alley, 
and um, George R. Martin, who wrote The Game of Thrones, um, lives in Santa Fe and helped them uh, start this place. And it's a permanent installation, and it's uh, something that you buy a ticket to, and you go in, and it's like a, it's an experience. You go in on an adventure, and it's not about getting scared. It's, it's just, it's, it's artistic explosion. Hmm. And it's an incredible storyline, and there's so much that you can never discover it in one, one go. Um, and it's for everybody. And it's, I think it's what they've, they've hit a vein of, 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 a, of a need, I think, and an opening in the world for, for this kind of experience mm. and making it accessible to people. Um, you know, instead of going the movie, to the movies, let's go to Meow Wolf. All you right, know? cool. And it's, it's really, really, really cool. And I'm very, very, I was so inspired when I heard about them for the first time uh, about four years ago. It was right after they opened that, that we went. And, um, and then this past, it was January 2nd, I got an email from one of their founders um, inviting me to participate in a project um, for their new location in Las Vegas that is opening, um, I think, will be opening next year. And um, so that's one of the things that I'm super inspired by um, is this expansion of, of uh, availability to a larger mainstream public right. to interface with art that is not in a commercial gallery and that is not off in the woods at a festival or in the right. desert at Burning Man, you know. Sure. This is a different kind of interface and I'm super excited and so honored to have, to be contributing. And so check it out, folks, because yeah. it's, the Owl Wolf is, is, is a massive organization already. They're employing hundreds and hundreds of artists and I got to go to their headquarters in Santa Fe and it blew my mind. I was like, you guys are doing it. This is incredible. You know, whole sections of experimental electronic light stuff, you know, you know, people are being able to explore and, um, and create and invent, you know, through this platform that they've created through this, through, through a business. Mm. And it's super cool. And yeah, I think, I think you guys will all dig it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to check it out. We're going to um, New Mexico later in the year to go to the um, Neem Curly Baba Ashram that just got built earlier this year. So it could be a kind of a pilgrimage of many different explorations. Yes, and you, yeah. I know you have children. Your children would love it. Yeah, cool. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. Is that all you want to let everyone know about? Um, I'm sure there's so many other things. Yeah, uh, keep workshops, an eye on. Stay yeah, stay tuned if you want yeah. to come to a workshop some, yeah. sometime. I am working towards eventually developing some online workshops. Cool. That's something I've been wanting to do for a while. And um, Yeah. Amazing. Well, so good to reconnect and I love your work. Thank you, Stuart. Yeah, all the best <laughs> and much love. Much love. Yeah. Bye, Have Amanda. a beautiful day. You too. Yeah.